I'm uh, uh, Professor Thorsten Passi from Germany and I'm a professor of psychiatry and psychotherapy and uh, what I'm doing is I'm uh, doing clinical work in psychotherapy and I have also done quite a bit of research in uh, relation to psychoactive substances, uh, clinical studies as well as psychotherapeutic studies with uh, psychedelic drugs or MDMA, psilocybin and other drugs of that kind. My first contact with uh, psychedelic drugs was uh, after I had a mystical experience uh, by being in nature. Everything became one and I had fantastic kind of feelings and my intuition was that that was the most worthful and the most intense experience a human can have. And so I was really irritated by that experience because it also had some implication for spirituality or religiosity if you want. And so I had a very hard time to integrate that experience as an atheist, which I was at that time. And uh, later on, when I did some research, kind of looking out for what has been written about these experiences and so on, and how can they be induced, because it was a miracle to me. And then I found that psychedelic drugs might be able to induce these experiences. And I was uh, very lucky to have uh, had some uh, psychedelic experiences which had the same kind of um, experiential pattern like the mystical experience and so therefore I became even more interested in the psychedelic drugs and um, then I also realized that these experiences can have an enormous therapeutic impact on the soul of the patients and so therefore I began to study medicine and to try to become a psychiatrist and psychotherapist involved with that research and then in the mid-1990s I was finishing my uh, studies and then I was uh, able to work with Hans Karl Leuner, the leading uh, researcher in the field of hallucinogenic drugs and uh, psycholytic therapy in Europe and I worked a few years together with him. We had patients uh, daily on um, mescaline derivatives um, uh, induced trips in our office. We had three different treatment rooms and we were discussing the experiences with the patients afterwards after they have gone through their individual trips and so I had a lot uh, could gain a lot of experience on a clinical level with these patients and I also have seen how much helpful that can be to some of those patients. Not all of them profited as much, but most of them did. At that point of time, the law was just uh, outlawing uh, LSD, MDMA, and these kind of conventional psychotropic drugs. But we have, uh, Loina has worked for tens of years with a um, derivative of mescaline, which has a very short action, but can also lead to deep reaching experiences with very low side effects. And so we used mainly that compound in uh, the uh, therapy studies what we have conducted at his office. Such as 2CB and 2CE? Uh, it was in fact 2CD, yeah, if yeah. you want to use that terminology. Yeah, And a guy who has been involved with psychoactive drug research at uh, Leuner's department has even conducted a very large uh, research study on the psychoactive uh, properties of that material in advance before we used it on patients. Later on, I also uh, became a member of the Swiss Physician Society for Psycholytic Therapy, where and I have worked with them together in the late 1980s, in the beginning of the 1990s, and since then. Um, and uh, I have seen uh, quite a bit of betterment in patients because we could use MDMA and LSD at that point of time officially. And uh, I have seen quite a bit of progress in these patients, especially with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And so I became more and more fascinated. And then uh, I was also involved in designing the trials which happened in the US later on. And I'm still very intensely involved in the matter. Later on, I was becoming a, a professor at Hanover Medical School. And during this, this learning process, I also conducted uh, some project in uh, projects, research studies, which uh, have been done with ketamine, cannabis, uh, laughing gas, uh, as well as psilocybin and MDMA. And so I beca became kind of a specialist in that field in Germany, but I was completely on my own. Nobody else was doing research during the 2000 years, for example. And so I felt quite isolated and alone. But uh, later on, I learned about the, all the approaches that MAPS has taken to 
bring MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD to the world, and I became involved with that somewhat. And so I'm still enthusiastic in the field. And uh, the funny thing for me personally is that I was on that track for more than 30 years and I felt kind of lost and isolated because nobody was interested in it. Um, but uh, since the year 2010, that climate changed and there's even psychiatry became somewhat open about these new treatment options. But this has also to do with the crisis of psychopharmacology, which means that uh, a lot of the conventional psychopharmacological medications are not as uh, efficient as we have thought. And they also have a lot of side effects. And this becomes more known to the medical community. So the kept skepticism about the conventional psychopharmacology is, has raised since the last 10, 15 years. And so now we have a new opening up for psychedelic therapy, which is much more into opening up for emotions and experiences than with the conventional medications, the suppression of emotion and experiences. So the uh, actual state of uh, psychedelic research, it's uh, becoming the whole field becoming much broader. There are even private investors right now, which are kind of furthering the studies. And there are also some commercial investors in the field. And the, um, uh, how should I say, the basic research in respect to the action and uh, neurobiological mechanisms of psychedelic substances have made uh, quite a bit of progress during the last 20 years. Um, and uh, I think right now the, base, the phase of basic research, which was also happened in the 1960s, uh, is kind of over. So we know quite a bit about the substances and their interaction with the human organisms and their impact on the psychological uh, state. And so therefore I think we are right at the edge of uh, becoming much more therapeutic in relation to using these substances in patients. And the phase right now is, I think that we have to establish in modern research setting with modern methodologies, the therapeutic effects of these substances in different populations of patients, as well as with different indications, means different mental disorders, which might uh, be able to be treated with these uh, substances. And uh, we have to, be very aware that we are not just talking about substances and their interaction with the human organism. We also have to realize that they are just adjuncts to help psychotherapeutic processing. You know, So we are still there with our conventional psychotherapy, but we might get some help from interspersed uh, sessions with psychoactive drugs. If it comes to the question of integrating psychedelics into uh, the psychiatry as it is right now or the psychotherapy profession, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to think about a few problems. One is that psychologists are not able to put medications into patients, so physicians has to, have to be involved. If it comes to physicians, they are usually psychiatrists which might have a psychotherapeutic education, which is not usual in some countries. So they might be fixed on treating patients with, with pharmacological compounds, but not in psychotherapy. The other thing is that during the last uh, even 50 years, um, I think w uh, psychiatrists have been trained to put psychopharmacological medications into patients, which kind of numb their emotions and kind of suppress their emotions and their responsivity to the environmental stimuli. And so this is quite a big of a paradigmatic change if we right now ask the psychiatrist or the psych psychotherapist to put something in the patient which is not suppressing the emotions, it's kind of escalating the emotions. It giving you more emotion, more feeling, more thoughts, more accelerating your intra-psychological intra processes and so on. You might inspect your trauma with the help of MDMA. And these kinds of things can be very intense for the patients as well as for the psychotherapists. So we still have not looked out in respect to psychotherapeutic methods how much impact is done or how much side effects do these methods have for the therapists. We were right now looking out for the side effects on the patients with psychotherapeutic procedures, but we are, we are not looking at the uh, side of the, the uh, therapist. How much is he impacted? How much is he exhausted from being together with a patient on a psychoactive drug for hours? 
you know, that can be very intense because all these kind of borders and the, the emotions are coming out, the borders are getting thin thinner, so the people are much more expressive with their uh, whole um, experiences, and so that might kind of infect you somewhat as a therapist, so it's really hard to stay with a patient for hours and hours and hours in these sessions, so that might be present a certain problem too, but I think the main thing is to put it, uh, if we want to put it into mainstream psychiatry, that the, that the psychiatrists are, haven't been trained for such a long time in these kind of num numbing emotions by medications. And the other strain is the uh, dominance of behavioral therapy right now, which is not looking out so much for inner experiences. It's more like changing your cognition, changing your model of understanding of your everyday activities and stuff like that. And so therefore, I think it's a much more technical understanding of the psyche of the patient, what we have generated unconsciously, if you want, during the last decennia. And so therefore, it's quite a paradigm shift what we might confront right now with these uh, intensive uh, psychological intensifying uh, drugs. If you ask me personally, uh, please forgive me for that, but I uh, still favor the term psycholytic uh, because it can include all the substances. And the main thing with psycholytic therapy is that you work through your psychodynamic and interpersonal issues inside yourself. So you kind of generate a healing process going on in yourself. And the term is in so far appropriate as it means mind or soul loosening. And that's what happens. You know, your ego structure is getting somewhat more permeable, so to say, and more flexible. So you can take other viewpoints, you can experience more of yourself, you can kind of lower your defense mechanisms against pain and, and other things in your soul or so. And so I think that's the most appropriate term to cover the main therapeutic model. On the other side, if it comes to psychedelic experiences, which are kind of related to um, dissolving the ego, you know, and going into a kind of mystical or religious, religious experience, which can be also very helpful with healing some wounds in your soul, uh, that might be a different deal and you might call them still psychedelic these kind of experiences which come with higher doses of LSD, for example, or psilocybin, and which might be also very helpful. But um, I th I'm coming from the psycholytic tradition, I admit that. Uh, but uh, what we have learned is that you have to work through a lot of issues in the long term. Otherwise, you might not change as much. Even if there have been studies which have shown that people uh, from an impactful experience might profit quite a bit uh, in respect to bettering their psychological health. Uh, in the long run, if you don't supplement that with psychotherapy or you, if you don't embed that in a longer course psychotherapy, then they might be back at their desolate state as before after a few weeks or months. And this is what has been also shown in the studies in the past that if you don't support by psychotherapy, the process in a long, longer, uh, way, uh, for a longer time, then you might lose and the patient might go back to his original state. And therefore, I'm a little skeptical about these ego dissolution experiences as the sole measure of uh, having uh, um, a therapeutic impact. Um, it is very tempting to overestimate the value of uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, especially in a climate what we have right now with the crisis of psychopharmacology. So there are no good medications out there. So we have found something after quite a, a, a bit of time where we had nothing in our hands, you know, and right now we might generate some uh, optimism about the if efficacy of these substances. We have known from psychiatric research in general that if a new therapeutic method is coming up, the optimism is taking over and the people are even uh, was, uh, telling grandiose things about the new method and so on and so on. And then later on we see that the effect size of the treatment, the efficacy goes down, 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 down. This is, for example, dependent on uh, how much enthusiasm is in the researcher and how much enthusiasm is induced in the patient. And then you put the substance, uh, that together with the substance, and then you have a, a good treatment success, which a year later, when another researcher, which is non-enthusiastic and hates the chief who has given him the project, 
you know you might think oh no i have to do this right now oh no that fucking bullshit and it might might make people psychotic instead of helping them and stuff like that that might suggest another situation for example um, even if it's not that worse what we know is uh, very recently when they have treated cigarette addiction with psilocybin experiences these kind of mystical kind of one or two time experiences um, they found that there were 90 percent of success Meanwhile, when they did a controlled trial with placebo controls and a more sober environment, it is 50%. So half of the efficacy what has been seen initially. And I think it is over-optimistic what the people tend to think right now if they are involved with psychedelic research. I think it will have the same fate as other methods that they will go down in their efficacy somewhat. But I I still think that they can be very helpful for a lot of patients anyway. And that will be proven. And if it is an efficacy of, let's say, not 95% or 50%, if it is 35, the conventional approaches might reach 15 or 20. So it's quite a bit more than that. And it's uh, also having the advantage that you have to take the medication just a very few times instead of taking a medication on a daily basis with all the side effects. So... I think that might be still good options. And we, right now, we are over optimistic, I guess, in some respects. But in other respects, we have really not explored the landscape in that sense that there are a lot of medications, I mean, indications, a lot of men kind of mental illnesses out there which can be helped by psychedelics. I'm sure about that. And we have not explored these possibilities up to now. It is known that uh, substances like LSD and psilocybin are not addicted, addictive. And this is also reflected in the new edition of the uh, World Health Organization's uh, diagnostic manual, where they say hallucinogens are per se not addictive. It might be different with a substance like MDMA, which is somewhat related to the amphetamines. But the main mechanism by, uh, by which uh, MDMA is working is uh, the secretion of serotonin, which is different from the, from the amphetamines. And so if you take MDMA on a more regular basis, uh, let's say every week or something, uh, your uh, serotonin uh, stores, uh, storages might be out of the serotonin, so you can't excrete any more, and so you lose the main part of the effect. In the former times, we thought, oh, a non-addictive drug, because the system is exhausted after taking, two taking it two times, and then you have to wait for three weeks to, to get these uh, serotonin bubbles recovered so that they can be excreted again. Um, however, what is left, if the serotonin is not working anymore because it's already secreted, then you are left with the amphetamine part of MDMA. And if you take a dose high enough, you will get these kind of amphetamine-induced euphoria and stimulation. And so you might go further with that. And we have seen a kind of marginal potential for uh, being uh, addicted to MDMA, but it's not comparable to amphetamine or not to mention heroin or benzodiazepines or anything like that. So I think, um, to come back to your question, the setting is important. So in crowded environments where you dance and stuff like that, and you might go away from your everyday problems and kind of suppress them and and getting out of them by being in dancing involved and being in a kind of ecstatic state or something like that. And then, and then on Monday, you are back at your everyday situation, which is might be desolate or something. Then you might think, oh, yeah, I want to take MDMA again to get rid of all these bullshit that's surrounding me. Do we see patients uh, coming back for having new MDMA sessions like, oh, doctor, I want to have another one and so on and so on. No, we don't see that interestingly enough. Um, this is because the people are in the therapeutic setting. They are really exploring their psyche and their trauma and their pains and their realities and their neurosis and so on. And this is uh, sometimes hard to cope with for them. So if, if you would uh, do interviews with them, they would say, oh, yeah, there's a part which is really nice and I uh, felt great and stuff like that. But for 80% of the experience, it was hard to explore myself and I was going on with my issues and I learned to never 
navigate the state, but I don't want to avoid my issues because I'm paying for that here to, to, come, to come into contact with my pains and my issues and try to solve them and change myself and stuff like that. That's really hard work. So I remember that Hans Karl Leuner was, um, was being interviewed by a uh, journalist uh, in the TV and uh, they were asking for, oh, what's about addiction? Don't the people get addicted and stuff like that? And he said, uh, you know what? Uh, in these states, people experienced their neurosis in a very pure form and that's not comfortable. If it comes to the question of uh, how much experience of the altered state induced by these substances has the therapist to have to be an appropriate or good therapist. And my personal view on that is it's quite clear. You have to have a few experiences with these materials, not just one. I would even recommend 10 or something in an appropriate therapeutic setting. It's a quite usual thing if you learn some, to do something. For example, if you're a phys physical therapist, you, you have to do it a few times. Otherwise, you have no idea what's really going on. And I think because these uh, altered states of consciousness, which can be induced by LSD or MDMA, are so uh, alien to the usual uh, framework, what you have, how the other pe person uh, experiences the world or you, uh, it's so much different from that that you have to be in, in that framework before you start working with patients. It's definitely so. And if you look on, uh, at the tradition which lasted, uh, which goes back 10,000 years with the shamans and medicine people which have used hallucinogenic drugs and detectogenic drugs for quite a while, uh, if you look at their use pattern, the most experienced guy is the medicine man himself. He has taken it in between 10 and 1,000 times. And so this is the usual format from history. So we have to uh, explicate why we don't want to use that model. Is there any reason for that? What can be counted as a reason is that people might get uh, lose of their objectivity, of their borders in between them and the patient and stuff like that. And if you have enough self-experience that you can handle the state where the patient is in much better because of all your experience, then you will have a much more satisfied patient and you will have better results. To put it in, in other words, if the, way of the, if the way how the experience of the patient is resonating in you, you, you might give him the freedom because you're not anxious. You know what they can experience and in what directions the experience can go. Then you might be much more able to give them the necessary trust so that they can let go into the experience. And I think that's really important because what we know is if a person is avoiding his own issue, issues or if he is not able to to think or feel what is going on in the other, they kind of being afraid and tend to suppress the experience in the patient because they are so tight because of their anxieties and stuff. They don't know what's going on in the brain of the other and how they experience it and it might be bizarre and stuff like that. So I definitely want to have uh, uh, therapists to have their own experiences and not just a few. The more the better, you could even say. If it comes to microdosing, you know, it's a complex question and there might be some placebo effects involved. And, um, but I, okay, I've written a book about it, so that question <laughs> comes up right now. And um, I don't want to do so much statements because we haven't done so much research on it. There were some studies in the past which have not shown really very favorable effects. And so I'm still skeptical about that. And, uh, but I bet that placebos can work quite well on people. And if they are um, triggered by the knowledge that a very miraculous substance is being in the system, you know, even in a tiny amount, you might feel better, you might perform better you, because of the, your own auto-suggestion, so to say. So, but we still don't know as much about microdosing, so I would be skeptical to give a conclusive answer.
Okay, um, what's about the career of a psychedelic therapist? So uh, a psychedelic researcher might be more a technical guy who want to do basic research on, on with some neuroimaging methods or with some biochemical matters and so on. They have to go there the usual path to to realize biochemical research or medical research in these substances, basic research. And if it comes to therapists, they have to be educated in a conventional modality of psychotherapy. I would definitely prefer psychodynamic psychotherapy because that is paying the most attention to the inner experience of the patient and its complexities. And you see a lot of phenomena in the LSD-induced states, for example, where you can definitely apply the psychodynamic model to. And so I think that's the most appropriate. So I would recommend that for uh, becoming a psychedelic therapist. And you will have to gather some self-experiences, might be in a legal uh, framework. Um, and also you have to go through some educational processes in respect to uh, applying psychedelics. The problem what I see right now is that these processes are too short term. You know, they kind of getting a week of teaching and stuff like that. That's to my eyes not enough to handle these deep reaching experiences and allowing them to unfold and trust them. You know, this is the main part, uh, how to be a therapist in that uh, area. And uh, I think it needs quite a bit of education and experience to handle that. And you should also look out for a person you can work with, which I've done with Hans Karl Leuner. I was at his side when he treated the patients and we treated them together and we spoke with the patients and so on. So try to get experience by experience, by, by trying to gather experience through experienced therapists. Um, are there any final remarks? Yeah, let's be careful. Uh, right now I see that especially the education of the therapist might be the vulnera vulnerable, you know, that there might be problems coming up with putting people under drugs which can induce pretty intense experiences and having not the appropriate experiential background of the therapist. I think that's the main danger right now.